Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be covering three really good adventures full of great ideas, really gameable material. Um, they're all very different, but each of them, in my opinion, is held back from being really great. Now, they're each held back by different things, and so I thought it might be useful to go through and talk about the good in each of these adventures, and there's a lot of it, and then to talk about where these things maybe could use some work. Now, two of them are just done. They're finished products. The second one that I'm going to be covering is a, kind of a work in progress, I think, um, or at least I think it's able to be revised pretty easily. Um, I would just say that each of these, though, it doesn't quite achieve the, the you know top tier status, in my opinion. Now, I, I don't really like to do critical reviews all that often, or at least very critical, negative, I mean. I, I, I prefer to highlight the good in, in the books that I, I run into. Sometimes I have, you know, I'll point out things that I don't like about an adventure or things that are confusing, but for the most part, I just pick adventures that I think are really excellent. But from time to time, I think it might be useful for me to go through things that are just not quite at the same top tier level, because all of us, right, are trying to uh, get better as adventure designers and as DMs and GMs and all that. So I think it might be really useful for all of us to go through adventures from time to time that are just not quite as good as, you know, some of the top tier adventures. And, and then to see why. Because, you know, any adventure that we put together can be excellent if we just put in the right time and we do the right things and we, we you know, manage to get the, the, the magic recipe to come all together. So that's what I'm going to be doing in this one is going through and talking about some things that hold these adventures back. Again, while highlighting the good. The first one that I want to cover is The Slumbering City by Tom Wilson. The second is The Nightmare's Reign by Brady Nash. And the third is the second issue of Downsized Dungeons, The Undying Minds. I think this is by Dave Serrett. Um, these are all very different adventures. Downsized Dungeons is pay what you want. Uh, this one, Nashcraft, uh, or The Nightmare's Reign, excuse me, was provided to me free by one of my viewers who said, hey, do you want to check this out and give me some thoughts? And I was like, great, sure. I think you can get it on DriveThruRPG as well, um, but I'll put the links below to all this stuff. And then the the uh, Slumbering City was just recently kickstarted. I backed it at the lowest tier level, which was just a PDF. But Tom Wilson, who is the designer or the the, the you know the guy who created it, was so generous to everybody, you know, all the backers. He gave two page adventures for free that were added on, just to get you know tons of them, and I got a ton of different documents for a very low backing. Um, and so it was very generous, and I wanted to highlight that. Okay, so I'm going to go through each of these. You can get this one, I think, for $10 on Drive Through RPG. So let me go through, first of all, The Slumbering City. First of all, the, 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 this adventure is designed for Shadow Dark explicitly, and that's one area where I might talk about uh, some, uh, some issues. Maybe not issues, but some things that perhaps need to be, uh, gosh, uh, need to be worked on. And we'll talk about more. There are particular design choices that that compete with Shadow Dark's experience system, and and it, well, I'll talk about it more. But it, overall, it, it's it's a very good design for Shadow Dark for most for the most part. Uh, the table of contents is not hyperlinked, <laughs> which is a, a minor gripe. But it would be nice. A forty-page PDF, which is what this is, is not terribly um, it's not terribly necessary. But it would still be nice. This is intentionally inspired by Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian, and you can see it throughout the entire adventure. It's very much inspired by that. It feels like something that would fit right in a, uh, a Conan the Barbarian story. And in fact, one of, the appendix, one of the appendices includes a new class for Shadow Dark the Barbarian. I'll cover that as well. Now, you get a good overview and a good background. One of the things right away that I noticed, and, and um, well, one of the things I noticed that I didn't quite like about this was the difference between my expectation of the adventure because of how it describes itself and the adventure itself. It calls itself the, a slumbering city. And in the overview and in the background, you get this sense of this ancient oasis city in the heart of a great desert. You get a, the city of dreams, sand pitted walls, cracked spires, uh, immeasurable wealth, great magic. You get a sense of a, of a, of a city, right? But it's, it's, it's marketing itself as a big city. And then you get to the actual city map and it's like 20 buildings. It feels like something out of The Legend of Zelda, maybe, right? You go into a, a city, Goron City or something, and it's like 20, 15 buildings. And you can set it aside 
in terms of your expectations because it's a video game and the world itself and the size of all that stuff. But in an RPG, you're not limited by those sorts of things. And so getting the map of the city, I was like, whoa, this place is small. This isn't a city. This is a this is like a commune, right? Or a palace or something, like, a, like an extended palace. And I think that would really matter to your players. If you market this, hey, we're going to be going to this lost city full of treasure and magic and stuff, and then they get there and it's like one main street, a couple alleys, and, you know, 20 buildings. They're going to be like, what? Where's the city? This is this is not a city. So you just, that's, that, you know, I noticed this throughout. There are, there are mislabelings of things like that. Not to say that the content is bad. It is a good, it would be a great palace or a great commune or something like that but it's not a city. And I think that actually is a problem if you as a DM are intending to buy this, right? If you were going to buy this and say, okay, well, it's 10 bucks for a PDF, 40 pages, but it's a city, so it's gonna be a lot of stuff there. And then you get it and it's basically a dungeon about the size of a, you know, a 20 page or a 20 room dungeon on the top going down a couple levels, I think it's 40 rooms all said and done. That's really going to be at odds, I think. Now, fortunately, the, the random tables that you get do uh, as you'll see, do tend to expand a bit and, and make it feel bigger. And so you could easily expand this. You could make this uh, a, a part of a bigger city, ruined and, and in, in decay or something like that. This is like the palace at the, on the top of the hill, or this is some, you know, you could do that and expand out a, a larger city around the players kind of have to crawl through to get here. But as written, it doesn't really feel like a city. And I think that causes problems for a DM and it would cause problems for the players who are reading it. Or, and who are playing through it, I think they would have that jar of expectations. So that's something that needs, you know, that, that you running this game, I would, you, you would want to change. Another thing that I find to be a little bit maybe confusing here is this name of this label, Faction. So again, because it's a city campaign, you expect factions, but the factions really aren't factions. What you have are Stygians who are sleeping around the city. You have a, a giant monster. You have the pets giant cats who don't, I don't think they're intelligent, they're just giant cats, and then you have undead who are just undead and they're going to eat you, right? It doesn't seem like you have factions here. You have a faction and then monsters, things to encounter. But that's not necessarily a huge problem. Uh, because again, you don't have to call it factions, it's just in terms of expectations, it's just in terms of labeling. I don't really see this as factions. Groups of people with competing motivations that you can ally with or play against each other. There's there's one group, the Stygians, that you can kind of interact with. Everything else, it seems like you're just going to kill. I mean, maybe the saber tooth cats you could interact with, train a bit, but I'm not sure that would be a distinct faction here. So, I don't know, you know, that's just a, maybe it's a nitpick. But it's something that, again, it was jarring. I saw it and I was like, okay, good factions. And then I read through it and I was like, these aren't really factions. There's one faction, one group. And, and they're individually interactable, but they're not really interactable as a group. The, the, the Stygians don't do anything together. They're just individuals that you can run into in the city, basically. Rumor tables are great, not terribly gameable. They're the sorts of things that you would tell a player ahead of time to try to get them interested. Hey guys, there's a dead in the city with woeful whales. You can hear the screeches of cats from the inside. That's kind of interesting. Dead roam the streets. Right, uh, one guy went in and said that there was a, a fortune inside. Those aren't rumors that you would give the players to to be gameable, right? Rumors, in 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 my mind, good rumors in RPGs are things that are gameable. Hey, don't open any doors where you can hear wind rushing behind it. That's a good rumor. The players can choose to listen to it or not. If they choose not to, they're risking it. That that, that comes up in this adventure, by the way. There's a a a, a room that is very deadly where there's this sort of void on the inside. And if you open it up, you can just get sucked into the void and be destroyed. So that would be a useful room. Whereas I think these are mostly um, for flavor and they're, they're kind of included because you need rumors in, a, in an adventure rather than being super gameable, right? Rumors should be gameable in my opinion. Okay, uh, Zothoth's The Slumbering City, great descriptions of what it looks like and what it feels like to be there. One of the things that's happening in this city is that the time inside is moving more slowly than time outside. So if you come into the city, you, you age at a rate of one twelfth. Yeah, one twelfth the normal rate. So players should maybe have a rumor about that. And there are, this is one of the main major 
features of this dungeon, which is things that you bring out of the dungeon can age. And it's really, really, really high chance for some things. For most coins, it's like 70% chance that they age to dust or they, they rust away to nothing. That would be so frustrating for players, especially if they have died here. This is a mechanic that I think I just hate. I like it in theory. It makes a ton of sense in ideas. It's a cool idea. It's a horrible game mechanic. Players would be so cheated. They would feel so, so cheated to come out of the city and to lose 70% of their coins to dust. No, oh man, no way. And <laughs> even legendary items have a 5% chance of rusting away to nothing. Now granted, 5% is pretty low, but that would just be death for my players. They would, they would quit. They would, they would flip the table, man. So no, that is a terrible mechanic. Sorry, it is just is terrible. <laughs> I like the idea, and I think that it could be cool, but man, to take away 70% of, of the coins you bring out, and it's, you know, the different, the different materials have different chances. I just, I think that's a terrible mechanic. I really, really do. I would completely just not do that. Um, the, one of the things that this aging thing does is it, it, it does help explain one of the major, I thought, plot holes of the adventure, which is why do the Stygians not leave? That's not really explained. Uh, they've awoken this demon under the city that eats them. It comes up and eats them slowly, and they can't really stop it. So they turn to this black lotus to drug them and to keep themselves sedated and to just sleep the time and not try to worry about it. And there, nowhere is it said that they couldn't just leave. And it seems like, well, if there's this thing that's going to eat you, probably would be better to leave. Well, you could say that the longer you spend in here, the more you are affected by the time dilation thing. So that if you left, you would just get, you know, turned to dust. And so those who have stayed are those who have chosen to stay rather than to just turn to dust and leave. So I could see doing it as an explanation to one of the plot holes, but as a game mechanic, um, well, it does say non-magic items, so magic items that can, that can be taken out, but coins, gems, books, and cloth can age and, and be destroyed. Man, I think that would be so frustrating, especially in a game where experience is tied to treasure recovered. So does that mean that you give them experience based on what they would have gotten out? or what they actually get out. It better be, the, for better be the, the former, because if you give it to the latter, then they could go through this whole adventure and lose most of the experience that they get from it. So again, I think this is, an, a, a, this is one of those mechanics that makes total sense in theory, but for a game like Shadow Dark, and for a dungeon crawling game, for most players, it's antithetical to fun, it's anti-fun. So I would just not do it, not mechanically. Maybe you could say that some of it fades and ages, but whatever they're left with better be enough to make it worth it for the players and to, and to give them experience points and all that. So anyway, that, that was one of my big problems with this adventure, was this aging mechanic. Because again, I could just see this, if I tried to pull this at my table, my players would rebel. Now maybe that's just my players, but I think a lot of tables are gonna be like that. So keep that in mind, if you're gonna run this adventure, don't run that premature aging unless you're with a particular group of players that does not care about loot. And if you're running Shadow Dark, that's probably not going to be your table. Okay, anyway, leaving that aside. The idea is awesome. The idea that the city doesn't age while the rest of the world does, super cool. And it helps to explain how this stuff could still be intact while it's this ancient ruin. So I like the idea, I just don't like it as a mechanic. <laughs> so there, there's that. That's kind of one of my big gripes with this whole adventure. Again, super cool, but that's not my that's not my favorite. Now the random encounter tables are great. You can go through the table, the city, and search all of these things. One of the things that's said in here is that the city doesn't have any poor, and that makes sense if you're going to be running a dungeon there. It also takes away from the idea that it is a city, because obviously most cities have richer and poorer people. And this does you know has wealthy noble as opposed to just I guess no, regular nobles. However, the encounters that you run into here are pretty cool. The Stygians as sort of these, these you know, sleeping last... It'd be kind of an interesting thing to encounter. You're going through a city where people are just a, mostly asleep. And, and therefore, that provides a bit of an interest when you're, as you're going through because you can try to loot somebody's house while they're sleeping in the other room. If they wake up, they're probably not going to be very happy. And some of them are pretty strong. You're not necessarily going to know that they're very strong, but, you know, they are. 
So here's here's the map of the city, and as you guys can see, it's it's pretty small, right? All said and done, it's it's not that not that big of a city. So if we're talking here about again this this, this dreaming city, I would be a little disappointed if I were a player and I came in and I found this. This is about the size of a large village. So you know, again, take that for what it's worth. Some players might not bother be bothered by this. Some tables might not be bothered by this. It bothered me. You get descriptions of the places. This is one more area where I think I have a bit of a criticism. And this is pretty much the last criticism that I have of this adventure. And that's the format. Uh, the paragraph text, even with bolding, doesn't do it for me because of the font. The font and the bolding, it's not distinct enough for my eye. Maybe it's, again, just my eye, but it just looks like a big block, ter uh, uh, big block text. And the, the bolding does help a little, but bullet points should have been used. Bullet points would probably would have increased the size of the PDF, but I think that would have been fine. Just bullet point and have the bolding each individual bullet point. Then you would be able to read this very, very easily. But because of the font choice along with the paragraph text, at times, it's hard to read. Now, is it is that's not a deal breaker. Obviously, by any by any means, it's not impossible to read. It's not like it's a particularly, you know, <laughs> really awful thing. But it is just one of those things where I, I wish they had, you know, we should just included it. It would have made it a lot simpler. That's basically it. So that's my last real criticism of this in terms of formatting. It's shadow dark, so you get danger levels, light, and then, uh, you know, totals of foes. There are no foes outside. That's cool. You get the totals at the beginning of each section. But look, like, look here. For the city interior, it says totals. Stygian warrior, servant Stygian magician, Stygian prince, ancient priestess, snake fanatic, deadly cobras, giant snake, snake swarm, shadow panther, set mummy priest, and skeletal champion. I'm not sure that's really useful to include all of that there. Maybe have numbers or maybe have a level so that you know at a glance which ones to maybe use. Maybe have page numbers for the stat blocks um, at the end. Something something like that to make to kind of justify the, the presentation of that total. Um, because, again, they're not all in one place. Uh, that's a lot of creatures and... It doesn't really do me a lot of good as a DM to see all that. And again, this is a formatting issue. So I think that's that's probably one of the things, as I said, the last criticism is just the formatting. Because again, the content, once you get into the actual content of these rooms, it's awesome. There's really cool, flavorful encounters. First of all, the, the art is great. There's a magical flying rug. There's master magicians who's sleeping with a servant and he's got a really awesome spell book with lots of spells. Uh, there's a library of knowledge, the palace, palace of Prince Bramaphilus, Bramaphilus, a Stygian lord. Yes, yeah, it's just a lot of very interesting things here with magic items. And that's one thing this dungeon has, is tons and tons of treasure and magic items. Now again, you might say, well then that makes it pretty easy, because you're going to have so much treasure from this dungeon, and there is a lot of treasure from this dungeon, that you're going to take it out, and yeah, a lot of it will decay, but you'll still have a lot left over. Okay, fair enough. But I know players, and players are not going to feel good about 70% of their treasure disappearing, right? All of those expectations. Man, look how much treasure we have. Look at how much treasure we have. And then, woof. Sorry, you guys don't get it all. That feels anti-fun. So even though you do get so much treasure in this dungeon, you really do, it seems undercut by that. Um, and again, it, it makes sense as a matter of balance. It makes sense as a matter of DM-facing design. But if you consider players' feelings, I feel like it's it's... It's just one of those things that's kind of a, a you know, a joke on, at the player's expense. If they don't know it's coming, if they don't expect it. Now, maybe you could, you could signal it, you could tell them, maybe even. But if they don't see it coming and they leave the city, they're just going to be really unhappy. And I could see that de derailing campaigns or adventures. You've got a lot of very interesting creatures here. The Temple of Set itself... Uh, officers' quarters, and you go down into the tunnels beneath the city. Uh, random encounters down here in the uh, place below. There's an insatiable demon, right? Throg prowls the tunnels and city at night in search of living creatures to consume. There's a deranged priestess, and there's other stuff going on down here. Totally solid dungeon. Um, most of the most of it is looped pretty well, so you can find ways through rooms. There are a number of empty rooms. They're just they're just empty. The players start off and say, you're in a blank room. Okay, I turn down the corridor and go to another room. Okay, it's another blank room. Roll for random encounter. It's not my favorite kind of design. But it totally does work. And and, and for a, a, a random encounter dungeon crawl, you do need empty rooms occasionally. 
But I tend to make even empty rooms interesting in some way. I like to try to do that. So like a table of graffiti or something like that, hieroglyphs that you could put on the walls of even an empty room, that would be really cool. Something like that, where you can add in elements of interest even in otherwise empty rooms. Uh, but again, the, the actual uh, rooms themselves, great, lots of cool stuff, lots of magic items, lots of spell scrolls, lots of stuff like that. You get a, a, a giant snake of set, which is really cool. Very Conan the Barbarian. There's a catacomb list with all the names of the creatures in the catacombs. And then you get the ca caves of Throg at the very bottom. Um, Throg wings, the e Throg the ever hungry, if not found it anywhere above, is down here. It's pretty gruesome. There's lots of dead things down here. Birthing chambers, Stygian remains. It's very, you know, it's very, at the very end of the day, it's very Conan the Barbarian, very H.P. Lovecraft, dark, uh, cosmic horror at the very, the very bottom of things, right? So it very much works in that, in that sense. And you get a lot of magic items down here too. Plus one chainmail, plus one plate mail, plus one mace, plus one spear, plus one steel javelin if you look through all this stuff. Plus one short swords down here, bra bracers of, bracelets of missile deflection. Just a ton, a ton of stuff here. You get the appendix of the history of the place, along with the tables for premature aging. So cloth and non-magical items, 95% chance to decay. Books and tomes, 90% chance to decay. Silver items and coins, 80% chance to decay. Gold items and coins, 75% chance to decay. Gems, 65%. Minor magical items, 50%. Greater magical items, 25%. And legendary items, 5%. I, I just, um, yeah, this is, this is not my, I, I, no. Nope. <laughs> Potions and scrolls, 50% chance to disappear when you leave the city. Even though there's a ton in the city, I just don't use this. No way, man. And then there's the extra class at the end, which I like. I, I think I probably wouldn't use it unless I took out both the thief and the warrior because it kind of steps on both of those toes. So this is the Dreaming City. I've spent a long time on this one, I know. Uh, but I wanted to cover it because... Uh, oops. <laughs> because I think that it has that great idea, and then the execution of it just is not quite my favorite. Again, the formatting is just not quite there. That, that, that really interesting mechanic of aging is, in, in my, in, as I've already gone into it, it's anti-fun. I don't think it would be good to use at the table, especially in a game where, where treasure is XP. I think players could have wildly off expectations, and depending on how you rolled, you could come away, theoretically, come away with nothing if you roll badly enough, or if they roll badly enough. And I like that would just be the most disappointing adventure for players. But reflavoring it from a city to a palace, or expanding the city out around it, making it bigger, would 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 help a lot of the expectations. Doing away with this mechanic of losing your treasure and XP, you know, would help do away with that. And then the formatting thing is, you know, you, it takes you a little bit longer to read through it once, but once you read through it, then you know it, and it's not a worry. <laughs> so really, those three major issues. I shouldn't say major issues. Those three issues can be easily dealt with. And then the adventure would be a great adventure. But I think those are the three things, in my opinion, holding it back. The second adventure I wanted to cover was The Nightmare's Reign, which is, again, by Brady Nash, Nashcraft. Uh, an adventure module for OSR games. It also includes a nod to maybe 5e, but it's system neutral, is the idea here. There are stats given, and they're given in terms of Nave stats, Nave 2nd Edition. But you could pretty much uh, adapt this to any game of your choice. Uh, fairly easily, and there's notes about that in the book. Now you have to turn your kind of head a bit to look at the map, but it's it's reproduced on almost every page of the adventure, which is awesome. Something again, the Dreaming City didn't, or the, the Slumbering City didn't do is reproduce the map throughout the book. The Nightmares Reign does. So you have the overview uh, with some time ago over the past few few weeks, a few days ago, and then running the adventure. Now. This, it, this book is explicitly modeled after The Waking of Willoughby Hall by Questing Beast Ben Milton. And it says so, um, it says so in the adventure itself. Now, the, the designer, when he emailed me to ask me to, when he sent it to me and asked me to kind of review it, he mentioned that as well. It's you know, explicitly designed after The Waking of Willoughby Hall. Now, on the one hand, that's a great thing because The Waking of Willoughby Hall is a very excellent adventure. It's one of the best adventures I've ever read. In fact, you know, it's top, top three or top five, in my opinion. So by explicitly referencing it here, you can't help but compare them, right? I mean, that's explicitly intentional. I'm trying to compare myself to this one, <laughs> model myself off for that one. And, and as a result, I found that it doesn't quite do what The Waking Willoughby Hall does in its design. So it, it falls short of that goal. 
Now, it doesn't fall short of it entirely or completely. It's still a good adventure, as I said before. Great ideas here. The central idea is really interesting, and it would be a fun thing to add into a campaign. But as a peer, you know, with the Waking Willoughby Hall, I don't think it is. It doesn't have that same level of playground. It doesn't have that same level of, of uh, you know, tinderbox that's waiting to explode. Wacky things will happen, but they're almost all wacky things that will happen to the players just by being here long enough, rather than as a result of their choices. And I think that's one way where this adventure seems to misunderstand, I wouldn't say misunderstand, it, it, it doesn't go the same direction as The Waking of Willoughby Hall. In terms of the interactions, in terms of the events that are happening. So in The Waking of Willoughby Hall, if you guys have read, seen my review of that, or if you've read through that adventure or played through it, you'll know that almost everything in that dungeon is up to the players. That the interest comes from players' choices, players' decisions, uh, player interactions. How are we going to interact with the NPCs? How are we going to approach the different monsters? How are we going to make our way through this dungeon? It's very open. This one has a couple NPCs that are interactable, but they interact in the same way when you meet them. It has a few, like it has wacky things that are happening to you, but they're the result of tables that are rolled at set times. It isn't as a result of your choices. So it's not necessarily a sandbox so much as a much more narrative adventure where you're going from room to room, experiencing the thing to experience there. And sometimes a wacky thing might happen there as a result of a random encounter roll or as a result of the... The idea here is that you're in a child's dream, a nightmare, and you're trying to defeat a, a night hag who is you know, siphoning her, her power. And there are basically references to her life in the different rooms that you go through. You go into a room and it's, it's something that she's been doing recently, or it's, it's her house, or it's something she grew up with, or you know, her, her, her tree house, or the village well, or the, the shipwreck that she just survived, which is kind of the climactic thing, the climactic fight. And in that sense, it is building towards combat in a way that The Waking of Willoughby Hall isn't. The Waking of Willoughby Hall doesn't really even need combat. If you, if you were to play through it, you wouldn't have to. You could fight everything. You could fight nothing. This one is very clear. You're, you're, you're going to fight. You're going to fight Glissa, who is the witch, or the, the night hag. You're going to fight, maybe tame the nightmare, which is the thing running through. Um, she summoned it. Um, and you're going to definitely fight probably the kraken, the, the, the giant squid at the end. Um, so it's, it's aimed in a slightly different way. Now, again, as I said, the ideas here are really good. One maybe weakness here is, is again, the interest in the NPC herself, Charlin or Charlin, maybe Charlene, I think it's, I think it's supposed to, well, I don't know, it's Charlin is it's spelled. Charlin is a, um, is an NPC, she's a little girl. She's not, well, maybe I'll put it this way. My players tend to not be terribly interested in NPCs unless they've known them for a while. I have one or two players that are much more interested in NPCs quickly, but for the most part, getting to know a character, getting to know their tragic backstory or their happy backstory or whatever it is, getting to know them as a person is not really high on their list of priorities. And so part of this adventure is kind of getting to see her background, getting to see what she was like, you know, weaving together, as it says, I think at one point, weaving together the tapestry of her life. And that might be interesting for a handful of players. I don't think it's going to appeal as the kind of focus, a focus of an adventure to a lot of players. Like the idea is, okay, we're going to go and, oh, this is this part of her life. Oh, okay, I see that's that part of her life. It's a really cool idea, and it would make a lot of sense for it to be, like, players. Players would be interested if this were, like, their their minds, right? <laughs> if you brought in stuff from their backstory or from previous adventures they had had, that would be super cool. But as an NPC, it's a cool dungeon idea, but it also is just, it's not going to be, I think, as drawing to the players as perhaps the, the designer hopes. That, you know, I think we as GMs are often much more attached to our NPCs and their stories than our players are. They often don't care very much. Um, so just that's something to keep in mind. This would be a really useful adventure to, to bring in after the players had gotten to know, a, a, you know an NPC child for a while. Like maybe this is someone in their home village and they've done a lot of adventures there and she's played a role in some previous adventures and so they've gotten to know her, they've gotten to like her, and then this tragic thing happens to her. Then I think they would be much more engaged with going through a dungeon that deals with her life and her memories and things. But otherwise, uh, I think it's a totally great adventure in those ways. Now, there, are, there is some editing that needs to be done. Page numbers are, are off, well, not often, but sometimes mis misplaced. There's some spellings at one point. The adventure is called The Nightmare as opposed to The Nightmare's Rain. Just, you know, things need to be edited a little bit. And I think it could be helpful. Now, the, the designer was definitely trying to make it open-ended. Um, but 
the open-endedness is given to the hands of the DM rather than the players. So again, that's one thing that the Waking of Willoughby Hall, again, there's, I, keep in, uh, uh, I keep mentioning it because it's explicitly inspired by it, heavily inspired by the Waking of Willoughby Hall. It's, you know, it's, it's modeled after it. And so um, one of the things that makes the Waking of Willoughby Hall so great is the fact that the players have a lot of freedom. What do they want to do, right? The goal is maybe get the bell from the giant. Maybe the goal is get the wild magic goose. Maybe the goal is escape the house. Maybe the goal is something they come up with on their own. But the way that they do it is really open. This is not so much. Um, if you go back to the hooks, there are five that are given, potential ones. And one of them is just any combo or man of the GMC's fit. One of them is the players cannot leave until Glissa is defeated. Another is they cannot leave until all three nightmare padlocks, which are things that happen at a certain point, they, they fall off, and the nightmare and or the giant squid is defeated. PCs can leave whenever they please, but every visit causes another unstable roll. And because a certain number of unstable rolls happen and then the girl is lost forever, so there's a bit of a timer. And then the giant squid and Glissa are defeated. So the, the, the solution to this is one of these ways it involves killing or defeating these monsters. Now, it also says, hey, you can do anything else you want. You could open it up. Maybe it's to visit all the rooms and to solve a problem in each of the rooms, or maybe it's to you know, find the little girl when she's hiding and to trace her down. But that's not provided in the adventure. That's something you would have to come up with as a GM at the table or beforehand in your prep. And all of those depend upon you, the GM, setting it as the condition. Right, so that's a, that's a difference than the Waking of Willoughby Hall. The Waking of Willoughby Hall, the players can kind of decide their conditional victory. What are they? What is what is victory to them, <laughs> right? If the goal is to get the bell, well, there's lots of different ways to do that. There's there's no set way. In this, how to wake the little girl, that's the goal. And and the ways to do that are probably killing the night hag or the nightmare or killing the kraken or saving the girl from the kraken or something. Like there's there's set ways of solving it in a way. And again, it's it's offered to you as, hey, you can also do it other ways. But no real help is given, and, and it itself is not designed to facilitate a more open-ended game. It's designed to be much more narrative, to go from room to room, and to eventually kind of spend enough time in the dungeon that the unstable encounters table triggers, and you can get into the final bot battle room and kill the Kraken or the, the giant squid. That's kind of how it's designed. If you just kind of waste time long enough, eventually the, uh, the doors will open. Well... It's also note noteworthy that that's not necessarily the case. There's a designer note there. And I really like the designer notes throughout. Really helpful to see the thought process of the designer. Um, but the designer note there is, my attempt was to move the adventure along if the DM desires the adventure to be a one-shot, but can ignore this if the pieces are having a fun romp or extend gameplay as desired. So, or extended gameplay is desired. So you can certainly ignore this idea that the nightmare locks just come off. But I didn't see any other way for the nightmare locks to come off, aside from the time. Maybe one comes off if you go to certain rooms and do certain things, but that's not really described. So the only way that the game gives you for these nightmare locks to come off is just to wait long enough. And then they come off and then you can go and defeat the Kraken. Um, and, and Glissa really doesn't want you to do that. So she will fight you at that point and she will fight to the death to, to prevent you from doing that. So if you've gotten to the point, again, all you have to do is wait around long enough, <laughs> really, and Glissa will appear, you fight her, you go through the door, fight the Kraken, and that's kind of, that would be it. It'd be a real waste of the adventure, but that would be a solution. It would be a solution that would seem to make sense from the design point of view. Um, there are unstable encounters, right? So if you, if you encounter these uh, things, um, bad stuff happens, you have to fight them or, 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 you know, interact with them. It's almost always the Nightmare, Glissa, or the, um, the Scarecrow, which is in one of the rooms. Um, some tentacles and other things can happen too. Then there are dream glitches, and this is kind of the funny element to this dungeon, the wacky element to this adventure. As things happen, if you get pulled out into the void or at certain times, you have a dream glitch that occurs to you, the player, and something crazy happens to you. Now, one of them, for example, number two, is ghost hands. You cannot hold or interact with physical objects using hands. I mean, that just basically takes your player out of the game, right? <laughs> that's, that, that's a real bad one. Um, silent is only 30 minutes. Whereas Ghost Hands is just permanent. So I, you know, maybe make that not permanent. Maybe make it 30, 30 minutes, like the others. Um, something like that. But, but for the most part, these are just ridiculous things that have, a, uh, have an effect on the, um, on the dungeon. They're going to be funny for your players to interact with, and they're very dreamlike, right? They're very dreamlike. You have, just like the Waking of Willoughby Hall, you have a cast of characters. These are mostly things to fight. 
right? You have the Nightmare, you have Glissa, you have the Scarecrow, you have the Boggle Swarm, the Glass Treant, Burwaz, Giant Squid, and its Tentacle. And Burwaz is the only um, non-fighting creature that you kind of, well, the creature you're not necessarily supposed to be initially initially fight. Um, but the rest are are just kind of intended to fight. And so that's another thing this adventure doesn't do quite as well as, again, the Waking of Willoughby Hall. Now, as an, you know, if it didn't mention the Waking of Willoughby Hall at all, I think I would have had a much more like, wow, this is a great adventure. Uh, but because it says, hey, I'm, I'm going to try to do that, what the Waking of Willoughby Hall does, I, I just don't think it achieves it. it, it in, order to, in order to achieve it, what it would have to do is provide a much more sandboxy experience. Rather than saying, kind of, here are some things to fight, and the best way to solve the problem is to fight them at set points would be to create a sandbox such that there are reasons to go to the different parts of the dungeon, uh, unlock those locks. Maybe there are different ways of unlocking those locks. Maybe all you have to do is three out of the ten different things will unlock one of the arcane locks, right? So the players can choose which ones they do. Building the adventure around that and having Glissa and the Scarecrow and the Nightmare attacking you at times or maybe being interactable. Maybe the, the Nightmare was summoned, but she lost control of it, and now it's kind of its own interactable thing and it can be used against the rest of the adventure or having the scarecrow be more like you know howl's moving castle scarecrow where it's uh not necessarily evil but it's it's uh trying to protect the cornfield whatever it might be have it be more interactable in terms of npc interaction and i think that would then bring it more into the willoughby hall side of things once i've gone through all of that criticism though the adventure itself is great the rooms designed are, the rooms are well designed they're interesting the destabilizations that occur in them are fun so as the time goes on bad stuff happens in the dungeon it's, it's fairly well looped, but some of the loops are a little bit harder to find. Um, like Charlie's room connects to, or maybe it's Wayne, yeah, it's Charlie's, or Charlin's room, excuse me, not Charlie. Charlin's room connects to the cornfields, the bell, bell tower connects to Charlin's house, the sanctuary goes to the wild land, the, the, the guild ship can go to the well, the treehouse goes to the bogwood. Like, it's pretty well connected. And the bogwood glade and the cornfields are kind of like infinitely looping, like Pac-Man, that's, the, that's the, the designer note. So you go off one side, you come in the other, so it feels a lot bigger than perhaps it is. And I like that, too. Um, so, the, the dungeon is pretty well looped. It's not as big as the as the dungeon from Waking Willoughby Hall, it's not, but it's a it's a it's a fairly good dungeon. It is rather linear in one sense, though. You go into a particular side of the house or a particular wing of the house in order to get to something. So the cornfields, you're trying to find the chest, uh, or maybe you you can find the chest there. There's a padlock with uh, rum and necklace and scintillating fairy dust. It's unclear why else you would go there. And going to Charlin's house, there's magic items there. You can get a hag stone, which lets you see the hag. It's very useful. You can get a magic toy wooden sword, short sword, which is fun. Um, and you can find a bunch of kind of children's toys in Wayne's room. But again, there's no real reason to go there. Nothing really happens if you go there. You go to Charlin's room, you get a swarm of boggles. Uh, you can get a dream catcher. Um, and then... There's, nothing, there's not, really, not really a reason to go there. So again, one of the criticisms I have here is that there's, there's, there's not really a reason. You're not looking for anything. That's when, again, Waking of Willoughby Hall is you're trying to find the goose, and so you have a reason to go from room to room to look through it. In this, there's nothing that you're trying to find. I think a really simple change. All you have to do would be to have Charlene be in her dream. She's hiding, and the things are trying to find her, and you're trying to find her. If that, if that were the only change you made, then you'd have a reason to go throughout. I think that would be all you'd have to do. So that's what I'd recommend. Add Charlin in as one of the things you can interact with. She's here. She's hiding in her own dream from the hag, from the nightmare, from the, the thing she's afraid of, the kraken, the, the scarecrow, right? She has some friends in here. She has the, the priest, maybe, or at least the, the chapel is a place of, of, of refuge for her. The treehouse is a place of refuge for her. Her brother's bedroom, perhaps, is a place of refuge. Like, there are places where she might be hiding. And I think that would suddenly give you a reason to go around and, and explore this place, as opposed to, as it is, it's sort of just, here's some useful stuff you can find in the different corners of the house if you gather them all together. And, and then, if you wait long enough, eventually you will have that going through the door. Okay. But, again, the, the actual rooms themselves are well described, very clearly laid out, cool stuff going on in them, and the destabilizations of the rooms are a lot of fun. I like that quite a lot. You have a diary here, and there's a reason to read it, but then there's a reason not to. And some bad stuff can happen to you, but good stuff can happen to you. 
It's a cool, it's a cool risk reward system. I always like those. Now, one of the things you can do, you can find ways to unlock two of the nightmare pads, uh, padlocks in the main hall. So that if you read it enough, you can find those. I might say that like your roll is two d six, plus one for. Or, you know, maybe maybe get to be a way for you to be able to get that 11 and 12 eventually if you read it enough. Um, well, each entry can only happen once. So I guess if you roll one you've already had, you roll again. So I guess in that sense, yeah, you do get to the end. So that would be that would be a reason to sit there and read through the book. Uh, there's a there's an interesting NPC in the Bogwood Glade. Uh, he's he's crazy, but if you if uh, if you come there when it's destabilized, then he's no longer crazy, and he can tell you what's going on and he can give you a very powerful magic item. And then you get to the ship at sea, which is where this creature is, and there's a black dragon there, um, or a gold dragon there, whatever you might want to do. Um, it, it burns, uh, it kind of has like a timer there, right? The, the, it, it attacks, <laughs> and you see you kind of have a... It's interesting because in her memory, the dragon was there to save her, or she kind of respects it because it drove off the kraken, or the, the giant squid. But the, the mechanical effect here is um, that it attacks everybody. So it's kind of interesting. I might maybe make this more like if you've done some things in the past, if you have recognized why she likes the dragon, maybe you can call out to it or maybe you can help ask it for help or maybe you can, maybe it only triggers if you have freed it from other parts of her memory or something or her other parts of her dreams or whatever it might be, right? So make it more of a payoff rather than just a thing that happens and hurts everybody. Um, I might rearrange that, change it. Uh, okay. Then you get the, the magic items, great little pieces of art for each of the magic items. Pixie Dust, a Storm Wand, Dragon Dance Hymn Book, uh, Magical Wooden Short Sword, squa Squid Mariner's Armor, a Nightmare Wondrous Figurine, a Dream Spear, Black Dragon Scale Dream Catcher. And then uh, the uh, information at the very end of the thank you page. So again, the Nightmare's Reign I think is a great adventure with a bit more work. It could be awesome. As it is, it's a good adventure with a lot of great ideas. Um, and the formatting, I think, is, is really strong. I really like how the map's on every page. I like how each entry is laid out. And the, 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 the events that are happening to you, the things that are happening to you that are really good and flavorful. I think you could take this and draw from it. If you didn't want to run it straight up, you could draw from it in your own games. If you wanted to run a, a nightmarish adventure or you want someone to have an interesting dream where they have to play through it or you just want ideas for more wacky encounters, you could easily draw from the Nightmare's Reign. So I would say good adventure, totally solid and capable of being great, which is a little bit more work done to the format and the overall structure. I shouldn't say format, the overall structure and design of the adventure. That's what I should say. The last one is gonna be a lot shorter. Downsized Dungeons, The Undying Minds. I know I spent a long, it's a long video. I don't usually do these reviews in, in sort of length, but I think this one is, is worth it uh, because, because of what I was trying to do. So Downsized Dungeons issue two is uh, it's a really interesting adventure for a number of reasons. First of all, the entire adventure, I'm gonna skip ahead, it's four pages. The entire adventure could be done with this one page because this page shows you everything that the book describes with one exception. It doesn't show you where the undead are. There's one keyed uh, encounter with undead miners in room one. And then in every room, you have a three and five, three and six chance of running into them when you enter or leave any empty room. So maybe these two pages, the stat block page, the map and diagrams page with under the undead miners put the information about the um, put the information about the encounters. So these two pages are, that's all you would need because um, if you go back a bit and go back to the first two pages, the descriptions don't tell you anything that isn't already on the map, or at least nothing useful that isn't on the map. So, for example, the prologue talks about this is a place where prisoners were sent to die, and it's a barbaric place, and it's you know, haunted, and it's horrible. But that never comes up again in the adventure. There's no, there's no chains hanging. There's no uh, particularly, you know, slavish mine attack creatures or anything. There's no encounters that revolve around it being a prison sentence or anything like that. It's just simply a mine with some undead miners. And then the descriptions of the rooms are, for example, let me go to room four, which is a room full of, it's on the map, it's, it's room four. It looks like it's keyed. It looks like it's full of stuff. Very interesting. But if we read it, it just says this, great machines sit against the east and west walls of the room. There are cogs and gears now in states of rust and decay. Old and dry rotted leather belts run overhead, passing through the walls to connect the machines to the other rooms in the north complex. More tracks lead north out of the machine room, but these are decayed from disuse. That's it. That's the whole thing. There's nothing here 
nothing here that that would justify an entry on a page. So that's why I mean this is this is a this is a two page dungeon that's been spread out to four pages with paragraphs of text that aren't necessary because nothing on that description gives you more than what you can see here on this map. It, maybe this is a case where the map is too good, <laughs> but I don't think that's the case. I think rather this is this should be a, a, a one or two page dungeon with descriptions that again are, are, are kind of useless. And, and so this I think is a classic example of overwriting. You don't need this. You don't need any of this. You just need those two pages. Often as DMs, GMs, we have descriptions of things um, that aren't really necessary. We overwrite. What do the players actually need to see? Well, you can describe what you see based on the map. Or you could just have the description of the room. You don't need both. And again, there's nothing in the room that's terribly too interesting uh, to justify its, its position. Area two is a walk down the short tunnel terminates in a locked wooden door still in its olive condition. A wooden bookcase sits against the north wall. A wooden desk against the south. Another locked wooden door ex exits to the west. The bookshelf full of ledgers and the desk with a quill and dried up ink pot gives away that this was an office used by the mine foreman, or in this case, a warden. There's nothing useful in there. There's nothing gameable in there. There's nothing interesting in there. Now, area three has three cakes of black powder. That's interesting. There's nothing else in this dungeon that is of interest. There's a treasure hoard. It's marked on the map with a gem. And again, if you had these two pages, that would be sufficient. So is, I think this is a great dungeon. These two pages of it are great. You could throw it in as a minor encounter in any kind of campaign. I would really like the gelatinous cube. I think I would probably make it wander the halls. You notice that the halls are all wide enough for the gelatinous cube to move through them. So instead of a one in three chance, or sorry, instead of a, a one in two chance, which is you know three and six, that you're going to run into undead miners every room, I would maybe make it like on a one, the gelatinous cube is encountered unless it's already killed. Otherwise, you know, on two and two and a three, you run into the undead. And that way you kind of have a bit more dynamic of, a, of an encounter. The gelatinous cube is moving around the dungeon. And if you don't encounter it anywhere else, then it's in room six down that hall. I might put it at the other end of the hall. It makes more sense that it would be at the other end of the hall. But still, not a big deal there. But this is one of those cases where I think it's, you know, tell not show in the, t in the text. And then it's show not tell in the map. And you don't need both. In fact, I would say the prologue here is sort of an imposition on this adventure. That this was, it doesn't have to be a prison mine. Again, at no point in this dungeon is that required for it. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for the dungeon <laughs> to know that. The players aren't necessarily going to know that unless, you know, you tell them ahead of time, but the dungeon isn't going to reinforce this. It's not going to reinforce that this was a prison. There's nothing else in here that would indicate that. So I feel like what happened here was a dungeon map was drawn and then text was needed to justify it being a four-page document. And so a backstory was written up and rooms are described without there being really any reason to, to describe them that way. Now it's pay what you want, so it's not like this is a you know, it's not like this is a big deal. But I think it's illuminative, right? If you can if you can get away with a map and, a, and an encounter page, do it. You don't need these extra descriptions. Um there's not really any reason for them. It doesn't help you all that much. If you have a really detailed map and you have a random encounter table, then you don't need, um, it, unless the rooms have like a narrative, unless there's an environmental storytelling going on that, that, that is interesting and gameable and will make it more fun for the players. If you're just presenting a minor encounter, a minor dungeon, a side trek, then you really don't need uh, paragraphs that tell you exactly what's on the map. You already have it. Anyway, these are all very interesting in their own way. And again, I think that's why I said these are all good. I love that map. I think it's really cool. I would, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to take this Undying Mines and put it into any kind of adventure. If the players are going through an old dwarven city, there's maybe a, a side tunnel that someone's gotten lost in, right? Uh, some, some dwarven child has run off and they suspect that he's been, he hid down those new tunnels. Oh no, we have to find him. And you go back and you find him in the back room. And, you know, that would be great. Or maybe they have to get a particular gem. Or one of the things that's interesting in here, it's described on the map. It's also said here is that there is a, an old fossilized remains of an ancient dragon skull or ancient dragon. You can carve it out of the stone. Great. That's awesome. So maybe they have to go and find that. In other words, there are cool things to use this adventure for, but it's overwritten and this stuff is totally unnecessary. This description, the prologue, the area descriptions don't add anything 
to what you have at the end. So you don't need them. And when you're designing an adventure, right, less is more. Okay, anyway, this has been, again, this is more critical analysis of these three adventures. They're all good, and I want to highlight that again and again. They're good adventures. I think that they're really fun. The maps in them are, are good. The ideas in them are fun. They would all be in, in entertaining for players. But they are all held back from being just, like, automatically awesome products because of these, um, these things I've highlighted here. So anyway, hope this has been interesting. I'll see you guys in another video.